Okay, well, um, welcome back everybody. I hope everybody had a good holiday season and happy new year to you. Uh, my new year's gift to you is no opening statement today. So uh, we'll get right to the questions and I think we have Bob on, uh, on the phone. Bob, you there? Yes, thank you, John. Uh, I have a couple of questions, uh, COVID related questions. Um, do you have any update on Secretary Austin's condition? Um, is he able to work a full schedule from home? Um, have there been any other senior officials who've tested positive since, since he did? And lastly, do you have any comment on the preliminary injunction that was granted by the judge in Texas in the uh, Navy Special Operators case? Okay, Bob. Uh, on the secretary, uh, he obviously remains uh, home uh, in quarantine. Uh, he is still exhibit, exhibiting uh, symptoms. They are still mild, um, uh, and he continues to uh, work uh, from home. In fact, um, he has attended two meetings virtually today, and I think there will be another one this afternoon that he'll be uh, participating in uh, as well with senior staff, um, very much in line with the, the same battle rhythm that he has had when he's been in the building. Uh, the, the, the meetings, these are in, in some cases daily and or weekly meetings. So he continues to participate remotely from home. Um, I myself attended one of those meetings with him uh, this morning and uh, he was very much uh, engaged in every bit of the discussion. Uh, but he is still exhibiting uh, mild symptoms and he is following his doctor's directions, uh, which is to stay home uh, for, for those five days in accordance with the CDC guidelines. Um, I'm not aware of any other senior officials here at the Pentagon who have uh, contracted uh, COVID. Uh, we understand, obviously, our obligation to be transparent with you uh, if and when that happens. Uh, and then lastly, on the injunction, uh, there's not a lot I, I can say about it, uh, uh, an issue which is under litigation, Bob, but uh, as I said last night, uh, we are uh, aware, of course, of the, the injunction and we're reviewing it and in discussions with the Department of Justice as to what the uh, what options uh, might be available to us going forward. Barb. Um, the coalition in Iraq and Syria has just issued a statement about the strikes in the vicinity of Green Village in Syria. Can I ask you some details? What kind of strikes did the coalition launch against these suspected sites? Was it U.S. strikes? Um, were U.S. forces at risk, and uh, who do you believe the adversaries were? Were they regime forces? Were they Iranian-backed militia? Were they ISIS? Can yeah. you tell us any more about this? The uh, statement is not very I don't clear. have a lot of satisfying detail for you, Barb, um, and I would certainly point you to Central Command to provide more uh, information. My understanding is that these strikes were not airstrikes, if that's what you're asking. Um, um, your second question about were troops at risk, um, I, I, I assume what you mean is were they put at risk in the conduct of the strikes? No. But they clearly are at risk in the region. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why these sites were hit was we had reason to believe that they were going to be used as launch sites for attacks on Green Village. So clearly our, our men and women remain in harm's way and we have to uh, take that threat very seriously. We always have the right of self-defense. Um, I'm sorry, and you had a third. And then I do have a different quick question. Who do you believe the adversary was? Uh, no, I, I'm not at a posi position now to get into specific attribution. Uh, that said, uh, we, we continue to see uh, threats against our forces in Iraq and Syria by militia groups that are backed by Iran. But again, I, I don't have specific attribution on, on, the, on who was responsible for these specific sites. Again, this all just recently happened. I'm sure more context will be available as we, as we learn more. And I absolutely uh, refer you to Central Command for any additional uh, detail that I don't have today. Different subject very quickly. Um, we have all watched the images of this uh, incredible traffic jam, if that's what it is, on I-95, not that far from the Pentagon, where many military people commute up and down, Indeed. Uh, stranded overnight, met some getting out, but many still stranded. I think a lot of people might be curious whether the Pentagon, the Defense Department, has offered any help, has been asked for help. A lot of, you have 
the, a Marine Corps base right there. Sure. People are wondering why the military can't lend a hand. <laughs> well, first of all, um, uh, as so many of us here at the, at the Pentagon are commuters um, and commute along that stretch of uh, I-95, um, uh, we're all um, we're all watching it with the same interest that everybody else is too, and uh, and our thoughts and, and concerns go out to all those who remain stuck uh, uh, on the highway uh, with these weather conditions. Um, I I know of no well let me put it this way Th there's been no request made of the Pentagon of the active duty military to respond uh, in any way uh, to this. Uh, to this jam on I-95, um, and I know of no overt efforts here at the Pentagon uh, to make a, 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 an, an overt offer or to get involved in any way. Uh, I think the governor of Virginia addressed this uh, this morning when he was specifically asked about whether he was going to call the National Guard out. He said he did not see a need to do that at this time. Um, I'm, I, what I am aware of is that the Virginia National Guard, their, their leadership, has been in touch with uh, state and local authorities, emergency authorities, um, uh, to, uh, to have that conversation. But as far as I know, there's been no demand signal by the state of Virginia for any military assistance whatsoever. Yeah, Pierre. I think we are starting a new chapter in Iraq, and the, there is a new mission for the yes, soldiers in there. How concerned are you that those soldiers are under attack from militias that are pro-Iranians? We have consistently been concerned uh, about the threats to our forces in Iraq uh, by militias backed by Iran. That is not a new concern. Um, uh, and I think we've seen in just the last few days that there have been um, uh, acts perpetrated by uh, some of these groups uh, that validate the consistent concern that we've had over the safety and security of our people. Um, but you're right, the mission uh, has now formally uh, changed to one of advise and assist as we promised and as we worked out with uh, our Iraqi hosts, uh, and, uh, and we still believe it's a valid mission, and uh, uh, we look forward to continuing to conduct it. But. To my question, or to my answer to Barb, I, I do want to just footstomp one notion, and that is that our commanders have the inherent right of self-defense, um, and we don't stay at this mission, this new mission, uh, with any illusions that our people are under any less threat uh, by these militia groups. Uh, we're going to stay focused on that threat as we stay focused on the mission at hand uh, and make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to protect our people. Janie. Thank you. Uh, I think you know already this. Uh, President Biden signed uh, the Defense Authorization Act on the 27th last month, which includes maintaining the current status of USFK. That, uh, how might this affect the U.S. defense budget for year 10, 2022? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? How might this affect the U.S. defense budget for years? You mean the 23, the one that we're putting yeah. together? I'm, I, um, I'm steadfastly not going to speculate about uh, budget discussions for the next fiscal year. Um, uh, uh, those budget discussions are, are just beginning, as you would expect this time of year, um, and, uh, and uh, when we can talk about it with more specificity, we will. The only thing I'd add is that uh, we're certainly um, grateful for the Authorization Act and the, and, the, uh, and the funds that go with it so that we can continue our critical missions here in this fiscal year, uh, and some of that obviously includes our commitments to the ROK and our alliance on the Korean Peninsula. The other question, so you may see in this report uh, General Abrams, uh, former commander of uh, the U.S. and ROK combined forces in Korea, said at the interview uh, last week uh, that the new strategic plan agreed between U.S. and South Korea should include a countermeasure against China as well as North Korean threat. And uh, regarding the General Abrams' mentions about the China, uh, South Korean uh, Defense Ministry spokesperson immediately responded with uh, this praise to this. 
why is the South Korean defense minister reaction on that? Do you have any idea why why they reaction? Not Chinese. Why they reacted? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, reacted about the uh, you know General Abrams mentioned about Chinese. China. No, I, 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 I would not venture to speculate or speak for the South Korean Ministry of Defense uh, and their reactions. Um, uh, and I'd refer you simply to General Abrams for his uh, comments and, and to our South Korean allies for theirs. Um, uh, what I can tell you from our perspective is that, you know, we'd, uh, we'd ask you to take a look at the language on operational planning in the 53rd uh, U.S. ROC joint communique, as well as the uh, Secretary's comments uh, back in early December when we did the, a joint press conference in Seoul, um, where we, you know, both sides pledged to continue to develop the alliance, which we continue to believe is the linchpin of peace and stability on the peninsula and in the region, uh, in a mutually reinforce, reinforcing and, and future-oriented manner. And we regularly conduct uh, combined planning with our ROK ally on a range of security issues. And, of course, as you know, as a general matter, we don't discuss the specifics of details uh, with respect to operational planning or sensitive security matters. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me go back to the phone. we got a lot of people on the phone today because we're all being conscious of, uh, of uh, proper uh, COVID uh, protocols here. So I don't want to forget all the people that dialed in. Um, Sylvie from AFP. Hello, John. Happy New Year. Um, um, the, the president said uh, that uh, U.S. will deploy uh, more um, troops in uh, Eastern Europe if uh, Putin invades Ukraine. So uh, does it mean that U.S. would send more people from, from uh, U.S. in Europe? or they would only displace some people who are already deployed in Europe? And also, does, would it include uh, missile defense? So the answers to the answer to both your questions, Sylvia, is, is uh, it depends. Uh, as we've said before, uh, should there be another incursion and should some of our NATO allies request additional capabilities um, uh, we would be positively disposed to consider those requests. Um, neither of those two uh, contingencies have happened. So it's, a, it, it's really um, not possible for me to answer your questions with great specificity. I would, the only thing I'd say is to remind that uh, we, we have um, a very large and robust footprint in Europe as it stands uh, under General Walter's command. Um, as well as NATO countries who have uh, sizable capabilities of their own um, uh, throughout the continent. So there already exists a lot, of, a lot of capabilities, and some of those capabilities could be moved around um, if that was, in fact, uh, the request and, and, was, uh, and was decided that uh, w would be the most prudent thing to do. So uh, there are lots of options um, uh, that, uh, that we have available to us, that the president has available to, to him and to his decision-making. I certainly won't get ahead of that. And what, what about the missile, missile defense? Again, I'm not going to speculate about specific capabilities, Sylvie. There's been no request for changes to posture or, or, or request for additional capabilities by our NATO allies. Uh, again, uh, as you heard Jake Sullivan say, you know, if there was another incursion and if there was a request for additional capabilities, we would positively uh, uh, we'd be uh, positively disposed to consider those requests. We're just not there right now, Sylvie. So I, I really don't want to speculate about specific capabilities when we haven't really been asked to, to augment any of the uh, existing ones that are already there on the continent. Um, Tara Kopp. Hi, John. Happy New Year. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, the announcement that you made shortly before uh, the end of the year about the shift of the command structure for the National Guard in DC, and was hoping you could elaborate a little bit for us. Um, what was the significance of moving it to the Secretary of Defense, um, particularly since the Secretary of Defense is also in a, a politically appointed position? Was there any concern that this would keep, you know, from optics reasons, if the Commander in Chief doesn't want the Guard deployed in Washington, would the Secretary of Defense necessarily then deploy them? Thank you. Well, obviously, we all work for the commander-in-chief, and, uh, and no decision about uh, deploying 
uh, the National Guard inside the, the Capitol would be made without consultations and coordination with the Commander-in-Chief, of course. Uh, but just to answer your question, this was really about streamlining the decision-making process. Um, and uh, uh, so, yes, it, it got brought to the Secretary of Defense's um, uh, in, into his authorities uh, uh, to grant uh, or to refuse requests by uh, local authorities for National Guard presence inside the Capitol region, um, he is in the chain of command. And I think this is something that sometimes gets lost. I mean, he is, uh, yeah, he, he is, as as we speak, in the, the physical chain, chain of command uh, already uh, in terms of ordering uh, both active and reserve troops uh, uh, around the world and around the country. Um, so that, there's a certain logic there. Number two, and, and I think some of this got missed a little bit, um, is that uh, we have designated in this new arrangement uh, his executive secretary as the single point of contact now for those kinds of requests. That wasn't the case before. So now, again, we're trying to streamline the way requests are made of the department uh, to, to make the decision making uh, more efficient and hopefully more, more effective. So there was also a bit of admin administration uh, movement in here uh, to try to to try to get the requests funneled in a, in a more uh, in a more direct manner to the secretaries for for his decision making process. Uh, Process. Is there any thought to uh, shifting that over to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that authority? Uh, no, Tara, as you, I think you know, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is not in uh, the chain of command uh, and has not been and is not, as it's laid out in law, his position is not to be in, in the chain of command to, to, uh, to order forces. Uh, that is not part of the chairman's mandate. Um, and again, that's. Um, that's laid down in in, uh, in law. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs is the principal military advisor to both the secretary and to the president of the United States, uh, and that's uh, and that's his responsibility. Now, obviously, um, just as in any set of orders that Secretary Austin issues to uh, to troops and units uh, around the world, he consults with. Uh, Chairman Milley, uh, and ab absolutely make sure that the chairman uh, has a vote, has a voice, has a chance to affect the decision-making process, and that will always be the case, uh, whether it's we're talking about the National Guard inside the Capital Region uh, or uh, uh, a, a, a Navy aircraft carrier strike group anywhere around the world. Uh, the chairman's advice and counsel is uh, very important to that process and will remain so. Motion. Uh, thanks. Uh, just ahead of January 6th, I was wondering, have there been any requests for the National Guard on the, uh, to be at the Capitol? No. Uh, Carla Babb. Uh, thanks, John. Happy New Year. I have a, a couple questions. I know you weren't able to talk about the responsibility for that, um, that rocket strike um, or that rocket uh, launch site that we struck in Syria today, but what about the two drone attacks out of Iraq, you kind of hinted into it in another question, but can the U.S. confirm that those drone attacks that were stopped today and yesterday were indeed by Iranian-backed forces or Iranian forces? Um, there have been some in Iran that have been tying the, the anniversary of the Soleimani killing to revenge on the United States. Uh, what more can you give us on those two attacks? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't have more detail in terms of attribution for those. Um, as you rightly pointed out, Carla, they're pretty recent, uh, just occurred. Um, so I'm not in a position to um, to provide specific attribution of, of a group or an organization. But, and I've said, as I said to, to Barb, I mean, uh, these kinds of attacks are very much in keeping with the kinds of attacks we've seen from Iran-backed militias uh, in Iraq uh, and in Syria. Uh, and so, obviously, uh, our working-level assumption is that, uh, that, that such groups uh, were responsible for these. But I don't want to uh, speculate beyond that. It, it's in keeping with the kinds of uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures we've seen from these groups uh, in the past. Uh, Eleanor Watson from CBS. Hey, John, can you still hear me? Yep. Oh, sorry. I, I have one more follow on the New York Times report about airstrikes done, uh, conducted by the U.S. military. Um, they, they had some accusations and they were saying that the civilian casualty cell that was responsible for following up on civilian casualty, um, civilian casualties wasn't always prepared for the job and didn't always find things that the, the New York Times reporters found really easily. So my question on this is, 
and you may have to take this, but my question is, what changes has the U.S. military made in order to better um, seek out civilian casualty reports and, and, and assess those, those um, allegations? Yeah, I think the Central Command spokesman uh, was uh, quoted in that story, and I think he provided some context about uh, about the process itself. Um, so I'd refer you to uh, to Captain Urban to 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 address this more specifically in terms of uh, what they're doing right now. Um, I think you saw in that in, in his response uh, that uh, he made clear that they choose assessment team members uh, from a broad range of skill sets, uh, and they try to do the best they can um, to make sure that. The skills that are most needed uh, are represented in those assessment teams. That said, um, and you heard the secretary talk about this uh, not long ago, uh, we are absolutely interested in constantly improving our, our processes and our procedures. Um, and without getting ahead of the secretary, uh, I know he's taking all this news coverage seriously, as well as uh, uh, his his own uh, curiosity in in terms of how we are um, how we are looking at the issue of civilian harm and how we are assessing ourselves, how we are trying to improve uh, our, uh, our capabilities in that regard. Uh, and he's, uh, he's working his way through uh, recommendations that he has received from both the uh, Central Command Commander as well as Special Operations Command Commander. Um, and uh, if and when we've got uh, some new policies and procedures to speak to, we'll certainly, we'll certainly do that. Uh, but it, civilian harm is something that uh, uh, we do take seriously, and as the secretary said himself, we do recognize uh, that we've got to do better. Uh, and so uh, we're going to continue to, to stay focused on this. And, and as we make improvements, as we make changes, we'll certainly be transparent about that. Uh, Eleanor Watson, CBS. My question was answered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike, Mike uh, from uh, Washington Times. Okay, Mike, I'll come back to you at the end. Uh, Megan Myers? You said that there haven't been any formal requests for um, guard assistance in D.C. on the 6th. Have there been any phone calls, meetings, correspondence, either with um, the D.C. mayor or the Capitol Police, um, you know, opening the groundwork for that sort of thing? I wasn't trying to be cute there, Megan. I I'm not aware of any... Um, uh, Formal or informal efforts to uh, to look at a guard presence uh, on uh, in the capital region on the sixth. That said, uh, I would refer you to the National Guard Bureau here um, it, it, to to see if there's if I missed something or if they've had some kind of uh, informal low level conversation. I'm not aware of any, and I and I wasn't. Um, uh, I, I can understand what it came across when I said no formal request that I was trying to be maybe parsing it too closely. That is not that was not my intent. Uh, I'm simply n not aware of any um, any active discussions between the department, the National Guard and uh, D.C. Uh, local authorities. Uh, but again, I'd point you to the National Guard Bureau. Perhaps they are aware of uh, something at a lower level that uh, that they could speak to. Thanks. OK. I think we're good. All right. Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome back. And um, Happy New Year. Um, you've seen uh, you've seen we've instituted some uh, uh, some new policies here, and uh, we're going to continue to uh, to monitor how we're doing uh, with respect to COVID in the building. I appreciate everybody's flexibility. Uh, actually, good to see that we had more questions on Zoom than than folks in the room. I think that shows how seriously you guys are taking it too. And hopefully, we'll be able to get back to normal. Uh, sometime uh, soon, but uh, I do appreciate your forbearance and your understanding. Uh, we want to make sure that we can continue to brief you, but also make sure that everybody stays safe. So uh, with that, we'll see you a little bit later this week. Bye-bye.